Bible says he shows up. He inhabits our praises. So can we do that right now, just in a moment before we go into prayer? Just worship God. Thank him for, for life. Thank him for, for your health. Thank him for provision. Thank him that he's always there. Your best friend, closer than any friend you could ever have. Lord, Lord, we worship you. God, we praise you. God, we thank you. You deserve all the glory, all the praise, all the honor. It's in Christ Jesus alone that we have life everlasting. We worship you, God, not just today on Sunday, but every day. In every form, God, we want to give you praise, and we want to say thank you for who you are. Love you, we thank you for all that you're doing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There's a passage that I love. 1 Peter 5, 7. I love this passage because it reminds me that any time, any day, any moment, I can call on God. And you can too. And you can too listening online this morning. We're so glad that you dialed in with us. Because God always dials into his people when we call out to him in prayer. With faith, believing that God will do what he says he can do. The impossible. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, cast your cares on him. Because he cares for you. He cares about you. The New Living Translation, cast your worries and your concerns to God because he cares about you. You look around this room and maybe around your neighborhood and wherever you find yourself throughout the week and there are, there are worries, there are anxiety, there's stress, there's all kinds of things around us. Maybe you're in that mode this morning and God says, man, just cast your cares on me this morning. Church, cast your cares on me because I care for you. I care about every little detail. That's how big God is. He sees every little detail. So wherever you find yourself this morning, in a time of need, let me remind you, God says to praise him first, to give him thanks first. And then we cast our cares with great expectation, knowing that God not only hears, but God answers. And so as I'm praying this morning, praying for the needs around us, our community, those that are physically not well, those that are, are not here with us today, maybe they're home, maybe you're listening in online, and you've made your living room or your kitchen or your den or wherever you are, your backyard patio, patio a sanctuary of worship this morning. Maybe that's you. Pray with me. As we pray together and cast our cares on God, but starting with praise, as we did this morning and will continue to do. Lord, we love you. God, we thank you because, God, you loved us first, God. There was nothing greater that we, we could ever do, God. You've paid it all. And it's because of Jesus Christ that we have life and life everlasting. And so, God, we thank you. We worship you. We give you thanks and praise in every area of our lives. God, we strive to demonstrate the image of God in every way that we can as your church. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that, Lord, as we worship you, as we give you praise, God, that you would continue to meet with us in a powerful way. The needs that are around us, maybe individually, collectively, our homes, our marriages, our kids, our relationships, God, we pray that you would mend and restore as only you can do. And we lay our worries, we lay our anxiety, we lay our stress, especially during this time of a challenging season. God, we lay it all before you. We know, God, that you care about every little detail. So, God, we just lay it out before you, thanking you in advance and giving you praise because we know, God, that we know that without a doubt, God, you will make a way where it seems impossible. Things that we can't do on our own, God, we trust and we rely and we step out in faith with big, big obedience, God, and asking you to meet with us. So, God, would you meet with us today? you meet every need, God, as we call out to you, as those listening online and here in this house of worship, God, gathering together in person, as we call out to you with big faith, God, would you continue to do the impossible, God, to meet every need. We thank you, Lord, for all that you've done, all that you're going to do, the opportunities that we get to be about something bigger than us, God, the kingdom, 
of Jesus expanding not just beyond these walls, not just beyond this town of New Milford, but the surrounding areas, the, the state of Connecticut, the Northeast region. God, may the power of your spirit, Lord, just invade us in such a way that God is contagious and it's breathed out into the areas that we work and we live and we play. That the message of Jesus would be preached, worshipped, in every area of our life. God, we give you thanks. God, we give you praise for all that you're doing and what you're yet going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of God this morning. Good morning, everybody. Am I on? <laughs> Thank you for joining us today on this beautiful Sunday morning. Um, those who are here on location and also for those of you who are joining us online. Uh, we want to thank you for being here, and if you are new here, and um, which looks like everybody's familiar here, um, there are connection cards in the seat back in front of you. Please fill those out, or if you have an address change, a phone number change, an email change, um, you can also uh, update the information on that card. Um, also, in the, as you came in, we have the, I think it's multiple hands, um, the July handout, so it just lets you know um, what's going on not a whole lot because of everything going on, but there are a few things coming up, and um, also if you didn't get a notebook uh, for taking notes and reflections, they're at the table outside as you come in or as you leave, um, but there's also refills um, for your notebook, so you can take some refills so that you can keep going and going and going. I think those notebooks hold up 200 pages, so that it's just whatever. <laughs> And then um, on the July handout, it's the information for the um, tax sale coming up Friday and Saturday, July 24th and 25th. Uh, I believe it's from 9 to 4. And if you um, want to volunteer on either one of those days or both of those days, we would love to help. And also, if you have more stuff that you have found laying around your house that you want to donate, um, please bring it. You can contact the church office for a good time to drop off. Um, usually Tuesdays and Thursdays are the best days to come drop it off, but um, you can make arrangements um, Saturdays anytime so that we can get the stuff up all gathered and ready to go. And uh, Open House Prayer is back up and ready on Thursdays. We did change the time, so there's a new time starting this Thursday. It's going to be from 2 o'clock to 7 o'clock. So for those that are working that can't make it um, before 5, um, you have no excuse now. <laughs> and also, if you're able to volunteer for a spot um, and a one-hour time slot just to meet here um, to kind of facilitate open house prayer, um, you can see Mary, if you could raise your hand, Mary. Or Pat, you, um, they will be more than happy to um, put you on the schedule. And let's see. What else? Oh, and then we have prayer and praise cards in the back. Um, we use these on um, for open house prayer as well. If you do have a prayer request, you can fill out the blue card. If you have a praise report, you can fill out the green-ish card. <laughs> Um, we'd love to hear what God is doing um, through the prayer report. So um, you can put them in the offering box up front or um, hand them to one of the hosts, um, either coming or going, and um, we'll get those going. And then I believe I lost my notes. Hold on. Where am I? There I am. <laughs> Speaking of the gift box, there uh, you can uh, put your uh, time and offering in the gift box, or you can give online, or you can text give, um, 860-500-1717, and that's an easy ways to give there, and then all this information that I just said, if I just babbled in your ears, <laughs> you can find it all on our website at newmilfordassembly.church.
we doing in the middle of an assembly? Good, good. Everybody's awake. Everybody's here for the most part, most of you anyway. And uh, I'm so, so grateful um, that we get to actually gather in person. How many are excited about that? Uh, so no more emails. Hey, when are we getting together? What's going on? Come on, come on, come on. So here we are, right? So I just want to encourage you and say thank you so much for taking time. Those of you listening online, so um, hopefully you can see me really well now. Um, we're kind of working out the kinks and all the different things of our, of our media space. We're so glad that you took some time to grab some time with us online in the Milford Assembly, and uh, hopefully you've enjoyed the worship. We're going to unpack the Word of God together. We're so glad that you're here today as well. And I just want to remind you of a couple of things um, as we're moving forward. We're in a new series. How many uh, enjoyed last Sunday as we kind of jump started? Um, a really uh, tough but uh, important conversation that we'll continue to work through through the whole month of July. If you missed our opener, um, then uh, you can check it out on our website at newmilfordassembly.church. Check it out on our Facebook page. I'm at New Milford Assembly or our YouTube channel. So we're trying to get a little more techie savvy and kind of get through all the kinks uh, and uh, do better uh, at presenting um, whatever we can online, the message of the gospel uh, with excellence. Nobody's perfect, right? Uh, but we do strive for excellence at New Milford Assembly. And I'm so grateful for our team. Thank you, uh, Team Hoth Hospitality Team, our host out in our welcome tent, uh, just checking in people. Also, our cafe. Thank you so much. Uh, for all that's going on. If you have any um, opportunities, need to move around the building, uh, we just ask you to wear the mask while you're seated. You're totally good. We got social distancing six feet apart. Everybody's good, right? We all feel good and comfortable. Online, how you guys feel? Pretty good and comfortable? You're probably in your jammies, aren't you? Kind of hanging out with coffee or breakfast. That's all good. Um, so as long as you're here with us, we are excited uh, because every time we open up the Word of God, the Word of God speaks. Amen? And uh, when the Word of God speaks, I don't know about you, I want to be a really good listener. Uh, and not just a really good listener, but I want to be uh, obedient. I want to take some action steps. And that's really where uh, we as a church at the Milford Assembly are all about. Our mission here at the Milford Assembly, Assembly is simple. It's to point people to Jesus with the message of the gospel, uh, the words of God, where real life takes place. It happens. And I'm seeing that and sensing that even in my own life every day as I open up this amazing book where God guides us by his spirit into some truth and some doctrines to help us navigate through life no matter where you find yourself. And so no matter where you are on the Jesus journey, God has something special and powerful that he wants to relate to you today. Um, maybe you've already kind of experienced that. Hopefully you have in our worship. And I'm so grateful uh, for our worship team. We've got uh, a few from different churches coming together, collaborating. So grateful uh, for the Reach Church out of Westchester, um, as well as Bethany Church. Thank you so much for loading your uh, team on the team us again. Pastor Chris and Mary Duncan and, our, and their family are on vacation. Hopefully you guys are listening in and doing well uh, between wherever you are, having some fun, and uh, you come back safely to us. But uh, so grateful that we can have uh, some great collaboration, kingdom-minded churches that are all about Jesus. Um, and no matter where we are, as we help them, they help us. Uh, the mission of God goes forward exponentially. And I love that. Uh, I'm big on team. I'm big on collaboration. And I'm big on kingdom, capital K. Capital K. Mark that. So that's really important. And I want you guys to uh, just dial in as we uh, open up the word of God together, um, unpacking a series entitled Heresies. Wow, tough word, right? Kind of a scary word if you're not familiar with the the theological lines behind that definition, but um, heresies are simple in the fact that so oftentimes we can easily uh, be swayed to a false teaching. That's really what a heresy is. It's kind of looking at doctrine and uh, different sways and lines and leans, if you will, where people will say, you know what, well, I, I buy into that, but I don't buy into that, all right? And the gospel from uh, the, the Bible from the very beginning, from Genesis to Revelation, is this unfolding amazing story of redemption, is it not? Amen. In the beginning. And the ending is actually amazing, isn't it? It's supernaturally amazing. And so um, as we unpack this topic on heresies, we it helps us to identify, I know about for you, but for me, I'm always being mindful that when I'm in conversations, when you're in conversations and there's questions, like you have questions, I have questions, it's okay to ask the questions. The important thing is to make sure you have the right answer and the right, correct answer and the answer that comes from the Word of God, not my opinion, not yours or whatever. But else is thinking, let's see what God has to say. 
And so oftentimes, even in the early church, they wrestled with heresies. They wrestled with false teachings. And they tried to continue to make sure that they were aligning themselves with the doctrine of the Bible, as we are here today and always will be doing at New Oak Assembly, aligning with the Word of God. If there's questions and opportunities for us to express our concerns, that there's opportunity for us to understand the truth or the answer the way God has penned it out. And I just want to encourage you as we open up the, uh, uh, this series this morning, part two of this series, I want to remind you of a familiar passage. I introduced it. I probably said it a few thousand times because it's one of my favorite passages in the Bible because it always reminds me about how awesome this book is. It's, it's not something that you can say to somebody, I've got three or four, or maybe I've got one in my car in every room in my house, but that does no good if you don't open it. How many would agree to that? And so I love this passage in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. It's kind of the backdrop of understanding that in the midst of false teachings that we can rely on the true teaching of God's word, and that's where our foundations of our faith lie. We're going to talk about the person of Jesus today. And it's so very, very important that as we look at that text in even 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, it says, all scripture is God-breathed. And it is profitable for teaching, it's for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness so that every man of God, every woman of God can be thoroughly equipped, prepared, ready for everything that God has, every good work, every opportunity, every moment to represent Jesus, to be the image of God, to be the hands and feet of God. But what I love about it is every time I'm in a conversation, let me encourage you as well, and those obviously listening in, let me encourage you. That when you're in conversations, rely on the word of God because it is the infallible, inerrant word of God. It is Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, God himself speaking to you, speaking to me, speaking to his church. And I love that passage because so oftentimes as we open up the word of God, we begin to kind of see the bigger picture. I love Old Testament, New Testament. Maybe you've got a favorite. I don't know. I, I love diving into the Old Testament and start seeing the unfolding of the redemption plan that God had from the very beginning as Old Testament, Old Covenant, if you will, complements the New Testament or New Covenant. And all of a sudden we begin to see the, the person of Jesus from the beginning that continues to the very end. And that's the conversation we're going to find ourselves here today is understanding who Jesus is. And maybe the fairer question for you, as I've asked myself, maybe even in conversations, who's Jesus? How do I see Jesus? What is my definition of Jesus? What is your definition of Jesus? You see, so oftentimes there are so many different uh, religions and so many different bends around the Word of God that see Jesus in so many different lights. Well, let me give you some clarification of who Jesus is through the Word of God. But have you ever asked yourself the question, who is Jesus? Have you ever asked yourself the question, who is Jesus to me? How can I describe Jesus? Think about that. Maybe you'll need to think about that throughout the day, just unpacking your relationship wherever you are in your faith in God through Jesus Christ. Maybe you're listening in and you don't have that faith. Well, let me encourage you today. As we unpack the truths of God, there is Jesus. Fully God, fully man, who loves you. And I think the more that we understand who Jesus really is, we begin to understand the heart of God. We begin to understand more the redemptive plan that God had from the very beginning where Jesus was and continues to let his light shine as we shine his light in our lives. So who is Jesus? In my travels as a, as a pastor and, and, and leadership and ministry over, over several years, I've had opportunities to, to dip into churches. I was a part of uh, a couple documentaries regarding the church um, several years ago, and it gave me an opportunity to kind of just lean in on different churches and kind of see, hey, what's their mission statement? What's their vision statement? Like, where's their view of God, the person of Jesus? Well, we have our view of God as a spiritual, Bible-based Pentecostal church. And I have so many opportunities to walk 
into buildings and have conversations with pastors and church leaders. And at some level, I was somewhat surprised at the responses of who Jesus is. And, and, and it actually took me back a bit, kind of thinking through, like, that's it? A good teacher? That's it? A, a good man? Like, where do you, why do you stop there? Like, I think you missed a few passages of Scripture that talk Jesus in a much broader brush, a much greater plan. And so oftentimes, the, the, those heresies or those false teachings, we see them and we read them, or maybe we're identifying with them in our world today, in our country today, maybe even in our community. And they creep into the church, too, because the doctrines of the gospel, of the Bible, get swayed and get misunderstood and mis. Interpreted. And as a result, we have these heresies leaking and infiltrating in. We attended a church visiting one Sunday, my wife and I. And I won't tell you where the church was other than the fact that it was in the Northeast area. And uh, we were visiting churches and just kind of feeling and sensing the heartbeat of God and seeing what was happening and where we were uh, aligning with uh, what we believe God was calling and is calling us to do in the Northeast. And we entered into a church and we began to sit down. And as we sat down immediately, I did not feel comfortable. You know, when you walk into a place, sometimes you just feel like, this doesn't feel right. I'm so glad that we come into the presence of God and we go for the assembly. It feels right. It feels awesome. Why? Because we are all about Jesus, man. We're all about worshiping the risen King Jesus. We're all about unpacking the truth. We walked into this church and we sat down in the back and we began to kind of just listen. There really wasn't much of a worship. It turned into a kind of a Q&A really quickly. It was the weirdest thing I've ever experienced. And I've been in many churches. And through certain conversations, the minister that was uh, at this church um, was kind of moving around um, a handful of people that happened to be at the church that Sunday. And he began to ask them questions. And I thought, oh, okay, maybe this is kind of like their agenda. Let's see where this goes. And the more the questions started happening, the more it started to surround the, the, the idea or the identity or the message or the person of Jesus. I thought, ooh, this is going to be really good. We're going to find out really quick where this church aligns. And we were very, very disappointed, i got to tell you. Because that Q&A turned into his opinion, her opinion, his thoughts based on where they are rather than what the Word of God was saying. It got really, really ugly fast. And my wife did everything she possibly could to hold me down. And a couple of conversations and questions were ensued to the point where answers were surfacing as this minister was talking about the person of Jesus. And someone had said, a young teenage kid had actually said, well, I believe that Jesus um, probably sinned. And I thought, boy, hopefully this guy is going to handle this one pretty good. I mean, where do you want to start? And the answer was, well, that might be true. I was like, ooh, what? My wife holding me down by all points. <laughs> talking through that, I, I uh, listened and I saw a couple chime in, and they were sitting in there. They were talking about the person of Jesus in their life. Good person. Decent teacher. I know of him. See, totally misconnect, disconnected from what the Word of God was saying. Tragic, so much so that just the way I felt, the way we felt, we got to a point where we were just like, you know what, I think it's time to go. I think it's time to go. We did. We dismissed ourselves very, very quickly. I've been in some churches. When you walk in the door and you just know that you know you're in the right place, like the Milford Assembly. You know that you know that there's a presence of God. You know that the people of God are all about Jesus. They're all about worshiping the almighty one true God, maker of heaven and earth, and the person of Jesus, fully God, fully man. But that's not always the case, is it? It's not always the case when you're in conversations, maybe with your coworker, or maybe a family member, or maybe you're just walking around the community or we're doing an outreach and we're having those conversations and we're giving them the love of Jesus with grace and with truth. So you can't just give them love. Hey, I love you as God loves you. You've got to give them the truth of the gospel message of Jesus. 
Because it's right there that you begin to see who Jesus really is. And so I ask you again the question, and maybe that's a question for you to answer today before you leave, or maybe throughout the week, begin to identify the characteristics of Jesus in your own life. How do I see Jesus? How do you see Jesus? Is he my Savior? Is he my Lord? Has he come for a purpose to bring salvation? Yes, yes, yes. Or is he just a good person? Or is he just someone that I read about? Let me encourage you today as we unpack this text. The person of Jesus. Sent by God. God incarnate. Fully God. Fully man. But so oftentimes we see different lenses and threads where it is contrary to the word of God. You know the early church wrestled with this right out of the gate. The early church began to wrestle with the idea that Jesus was considered first and the greatest being by God. Not God, maybe a lesser God. It was a threat of what's called Arianism. This idea that he was a created being. He was the first and created being. And the early church began to have a tug of war, like, wait a second, let's get back to the Bible. Like, let's write it down. Remember, the early church was like, hey, man, what a great opportunity to get our doctrines right through the word of God like we do today. We have our values, our core beliefs, and we stick to them. Why? Because it's the word of God. That's it. And so oftentimes, even the early church, like the church today, can sway if we're not careful. The early church went through it, and they went so far as even to, there was another early, early heresy called adoptionism, and this idea was that Jesus was a human being, and that that through his baptism, he was given the power of the Holy Spirit to do miracles. Okay, we got a little problem with that. And so this idea of adoptionism was, was talking about Jesus just being a human being and that when he was baptized, he had this power to do all these great things. But well, we believe and we know as the word of God says, Jesus is the son of God. And he came to seek and to save those who were lost. And he came with all authority, church. He came with all power, all dominion given by God. That's why he is all of the authority of God, because he is fully God and fully man. And so oftentimes we wrestle with this, even in our churches today. The problem with understanding and trying to wrestle with the fact that Jesus could just be a, 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 a created being is that, well, if he's just a created being, then he can't be fully God, okay? doesn't work. And the Bible doesn't say that. It's a heresy. So oftentimes in our world, throughout different areas of Christianity, yes, throughout different areas of world religions, we see this idea or identif identifying of Jesus that is contrary to the word of God. I want to unpack some text in John chapter 1. I want us to see a couple of things that I want to draw your attention to because it's so, so very, very important as we look at the scriptures that tell us who Jesus is, the character of Jesus, that we can begin to understand and answer the questions for ourselves: is Jesus who he says he is in the Bible in my life? And I am I living that in my life so others can see Jesus as who he really is, according to the Bible. John 1 Chapter 1, verses 1, actually verses 1 through 5. I want to read this because it really unfolds the understanding of Jesus being fully God. John's writing this gospel. I love this gospel of John. He writes this gospel of John encouraging uh, us in our faith of who Jesus is as the Son of God. And what I love about the gospel of John is that the gospel of John spends more time than any other gospels Understanding the personhood and the essence of Jesus. Take some time to read through the Gospel of John. And you'll get an eye-opening experience of who Jesus really is, according to the Bible. And then you can ask yourself, how close am I in my walk with Jesus to identify the person of Jesus of the Bible? That aligns with my faith, where I can say, I know without a doubt, according to the Word of God, according to my faith, that Jesus is the Son of God. He is fully God. He is fully man. 
John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5 says this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Well, I guess that's enough said right there. We could probably go home, couldn't we? But I want to continue to read, don't you? He was in the beginning with God. He was there. Jesus was there. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Verse 4. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Matthew just right out of the gate jumps out and says, hey, let's just clarify a few things. All scripture is God breathed, right? So God is putting the pen in Matthew's hand, and he's saying, let me remind you who Jesus is from the very beginning. Church, let me remind you who Jesus is from the very beginning. Genesis 1 in the beginning. Matthew 1, in the beginning. Jesus was there in the very beginning. Jesus was fully God in the very beginning. He showed up. Jesus was preexistent with God before creation. There was an eternal fellowship with God out of the gate. Why? Because that's what the Bible says. And if the Bible says it, I'm on to it. Are you? We're on to it. He was there from the very beginning. In other words, Jesus was divine. He was there from the very beginning. He's considered the Word. And the Word was God. And the Word was with God. That's Jesus. I don't know how else you could argue, argue that case from any which angle. In the beginning was the Word, Jesus. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. See, Jesus was not created and, uh, was not created and is eternal and, and has always been there with the Father. He wasn't created. He's eternal. He's preexisted with God from the very beginning. So oftentimes you'll have conversations like I have and you'll wrestle with different thoughts and different uh, religions and, and cults, if you will, and these ideas is, is far from Scripture. Or they take parts of it and say, I'm going to buy into that, but for my understanding... For my organization, for my agenda, I'm going to stop there. I'm going to begin to turn it. That's false teaching. That's heresy. And we need to be careful how we represent, how we present Jesus to the world who needs him. Because without Jesus, we're in trouble. John 14, 6. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Nobody gets to my father without me. On and on, Scripture unfolds the divinity, the deity of Christ in such a, 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 a powerful picture that, I don't know about you, man, that just, that just excites me. That confirms to me that, man, my God is so awesome. Jesus is so powerful. God gave him all authority. He was there from the very beginning. That means he's going to be there to the very end. And my thought for you this morning in that context is that recognizing Jesus from the beginning allows us to ultimately see him in the end. See, when we recognize Jesus from the beginning, when you say, you know what, from the very beginning, God had everything in mind for redemption, and that was Jesus and in Christ alone. From the very beginning, when you can recognize Jesus from the very beginning, it allows us to ultimately see him, recognize him, Live him out in every area of our life to the end, to eternity. I'm a stat, stats guy, and I love to um, check out not only like um, uh, churches and their religion, but I dip into just to kind of see trends and things happening, not only in our area, especially in our community. Uh, maybe you're a little goofy like me. Um, but I, I'm always uh, diving in and trying to see, you know, kind of world views and, and, and Christian understanding of our faith um, in the world that we live in. And, I, you know, the top three, I was looking through uh, a Pew Research, great resource, very reliable resort, resource, and uh, world religion rankings, Christianity, 31.2%, 2.4 billion Christians in, in the world. Second to that, in the world, Muslims, 24.1%, 1.2%. Eight billion. Third, this is the awesome thing that I think is an absolute harvest and mission field. Unaffiliated. Like they don't lead either way. They're like, hey, almost like, hey, tell us. 16%, 1.2 billion people in our world basically have no affiliation to religion. They, they're like, 
I don't know. Somebody tell me. Tell me the truth. Somebody tell me the truth. I don't know about you, but as a pastor, as a follower of Jesus, that's a mission field right there. And you might have that mission field across your street. You might have that mission field right across the cubicle maybe you work when we get back to working um, in public spaces at times. But you might have that mission field right there. That mission field might be across your kitchen table. I don't know. But we've got to give them the truths of Jesus. Fully God. Fully man. See, Christianity in the U.S., 70, a little over 70%, 70.6% Christians in America. Of that, now Christianity is a broad brush. Many people say, oh, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. Oh, you're a Christian, I'm a Christian. Well, here's the bigger question. Who's Jesus? To me, that's the bigger question. Because if 70% of the people in America are Christians, then I don't think, and they were literally Christians, like followers of Jesus, I don't think we'd be in the mess we're in. I just don't think we'd be in the mess we're in. I, I, I think, quite frankly, like if you really call yourself a Christian, see, there are a lot of Christians. 70.6% Christians in America. Of the 70.6%, 46, almost 47 are Protestant. Okay, Protestant, let's trickle that down just a little bit. There's all kinds of Protestants. There's all kinds of denominations, 60 different denominations in, the, in America, just in America. Why? I'll tell you why. Because they have a different view. Many of them have a different view and a perspective of who Jesus is. There's a difference between being a Christian. I've said this before and I'll say it again. And I preach it to myself. Trust me. I preach it to myself. There are, there's a difference between being a Christian and a follower of Jesus. There just is. Because if 70.6% of the people in America are Christians, my question is, give me your description of Jesus. Give me your character or the essence of Jesus to you. Because if Jesus to you is the Jesus of the Bible, then we're going to be in great shape. But that's not the case. 46.6% of that 70% are Protestants. 20.8% Catholics. 1.8% Mormon. Non-religious. Mission field. Who's Jesus? Mission field. Non-religious. Like nuns. Like I don't want any affiliation with anything. Why? Because they don't know the truth. They don't know the doctrines of the word of God. They don't know Jesus. The way we know Jesus. They don't understand Jesus, the God of the Bible, through Jesus, who is fully divine, comes with all authority to bring salvation to you, to me, to those that would believe. And so much so that God brought himself down, incarnate, Jesus Christ, to say, yeah, you know what? I, I get it. I understand. I'm going to help you. Non-religious, 18.2%. I don't know about you, Mission Field. So I keep going back to that just to help you understand that in where we are, who is Jesus to you? Is he fully God? Is he fully man? The Bible says he is. Well, if he says he is, then he is. That's what we believe. That's what we believe here at the Global Assembly. It's an evangelical Protestant church, Pentecostal church. Ooh, what's that mean? That's almost as crazy as the word heresy, trying to understand that. Pentecostal, Holy Spirit experience, the infilling power of God that doesn't change, doesn't end. The Acts Church giving us power to be witnesses. Well, man, you have to know Jesus to be a witness, don't you? Like, you just can't describe something. You ever try to describe something that you've never experienced on your own or seen? I don't know how you do it. I can't. But there's something about knowing the person of Jesus in my life, in and through his church, in and through your life, that when someone asks you who Jesus is, you're like, okay, how much time do you have? Let me tell you what he's done in my life. Let me tell you what he can do in your life. He's come to bring salvation. You see, recognizing Jesus from the very beginning it allows us to ultimately see him in the end. You see, the Arianism, early church fought through that, it was adopted and continued on. There are religions and cults that practice that. 
understanding of who Jesus is. But you see, in AD 320, it was rejected by the Council of Nicaea. The Nicaean Creed had a different stand on who Jesus is, and that's the creed that we stand on, on the word of God. It emphasizes Jesus' divinity. The council stated that Jesus is both fully God and fully man. There's a theological term if you're writing things down, and I hope that you are. Hypostatic union. Whoa, now you lost me, Pastor. The Nicene Creed rolled out. The council said, hey, listen, Jesus is both fully God and fully man. Why? Because the Bible says that it is. And, and if you choose to believe it, which we do, and we live that out in our faith, which we do, we begin to understand that God is both, uh, Jesus is both fully God and fully man. There's this hypostatic union, there's this connection that he can be both, and he is. Well, I don't know about you, but that's another bonus for us as followers of Jesus, to know that he has all authority, all power, and that he demonstrates his great love, God, that he sent Jesus in the flesh, human, to understand our weaknesses and to overcome them and give us, by the way, the power to do the same. That's a win-win. That's a win-win, church. But here we go. Who's Jesus to you? I'm going to ask that question. I want to encourage you with some take-home homework. Like, ask yourself who Jesus is. Wrestle with the fact who Jesus is, but wrestle with it in the Word of God. Wrestle with it with the doctrines and truths of the Bible, and you'll begin to understand, not just understand, you'll begin to experience that for yourself in more powerful ways. You see, Jesus is with you to the very beginning, and he remains with you to the very end. He has all authority, all power given by God to make all things new in your life. Jesus is divine. He's fully God, and God has given him authority to help you, to restore you back to relationship with him. You might be sitting in this room and kind of saying, you know, understand my relationships are horrible. I've got some, some things I've got to sift through, and, and this whole God thing, well, I'll get to God in a minute through Jesus. I've got other things to navigate through. Well, God says, why don't you start with me in the person of Jesus, and then I'm going to help you fix all the other relationships that you have. That's kind of how it works. But you know what we do? We say, hey, you know what? Um, I can't go to church right now. I can't get involved. I can't, I can't even grab this book. I'm almost too afraid to um, because I got all this baggage. And God says, well, cast your cares on me because I care about you. And I've got the best answer you can ever look for in, in this world. It's Jesus. But you have to believe. And you've got to give me the opportunity to reveal myself in the deity from God that comes in the power. God, and that's through Jesus Christ. John, 1 John 4, 15 says it this way. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God abides in him. And he in God. There's this fellowship. There's this, there's this supernatural. There is this fellowship that we get to have with God because we recognize Jesus in the divine. We recognize Jesus and the connection that he has with his Father that now we get to have. Well, if you confess, if you believe. And my encouragement for you today in this room and online is that you would recognize who Jesus is in the power and the presence and the power of his word. And you would say yes to Jesus because saying yes to Jesus is saying, I know full well that God loves me so much that he sent Jesus with all authority. To help me restore my brokenness. He's the only one that can do that. There's all kinds of self-help books and organizations. I've seen them. You've seen them. I've talked with people that have gone through them. I say, why don't you just pick up this one? This is the best book you ever pick up. It's the greatest book you ever pick up. Why? Because all well, scripture is God breathed out of God. And if God's speaking, I want in. Don't you? I mean, don't you want in? I mean, who wouldn't? Get into the Word of God. When you get into the Word of God, you get into the heart of God. And you begin to see Jesus in a completely different way. Not just the Sunday God. Don't make him a Sunday God. Make him an everyday God. And that's the person of Jesus. He wants to be with you every single day, no matter what you find yourself in. 
Those verses 6, 7, and 8 kind of just this pause. And so John is wa walking through this and, he, and, he, and, he's, and he, he, he writes out this idea that there was a man from God sent. And so John is this messenger and he's announcing the arrival of Jesus. Let me encourage you today. You're a messenger. You're a witness. And we need to announce the arrival of Jesus. But that has to be demonstrated in through our lives. Don't you agree? I mean, you have to be living that out. You have to be like saying, hey, listen, he's on his way. Are you ready? And that's what John was telling them. Hey, listen, um, it's not me. It's, it's Jesus. The light is coming. But on the verse 9, we see this, this idea of the arrival of Jesus. Jesus is human in humanity. And verses 9 to 14 says this, The true light, John speaking, The true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. Could you imagine? Here comes Jesus. People didn't recognize him, just like they don't today. They don't recognize him. Sometimes we don't recognize him because we're too busy. We're too preoccupied with the noises and things around us. Even the early church, so oftentimes, in the word of God being breathed out reminds us, be careful. He came to his own, and his own people did not even receive him. But to all, I love this, all to received him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. That's relationship. That's good relationship. That's true relationship. Who were born not of blood, not of the will of the flesh, or of the will of man, but of God. That's the only way. He was born of God. So you know full well there's a relationship kindling from the very beginning where Jesus was, and that relationship begins to unfold, Old Testament to New Testament, and here he comes. And he wants relationship with you. He wants relationship. Not of any other way, not of the flesh or of the blood or of anything, but of God. The power, the spirit of God. And the word, verse 14, became flesh. I don't know how you can argue Jesus cannot be fully God and fully man. Verse 14, and the word of God became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory. Glory as the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. You see, Jesus has come in the human flesh to bring the light of salvation to you and to me. He showed up. That's how much God loves you. He loves you so much that he personally came down, said, I want to be with you. I want relationship with you. I've been there. I've done it. I want to help you. I want to give you the power that God has given me, the, the, the supernatural awakening presence of God to do all the things God's called me to do and to restore relationship back to God. See, Jesus was, he was in the world. He was, he, and he was created through God, yet many did not recognize him. And those who believed him, the Bible says, they received forgiveness, they received restoration. And that's where we are today. We have the opportunity. Because God loves us so much that he sent Jesus in the person, personally, for you and for me, for relationship, to restore, and to bring salvation to everyone who would believe. Do you believe? Are you in a position where you can begin to see and sense Jesus, maybe in a different light this morning, maybe as you're listening, those of you online, you're beginning to kind of see, hopefully, a broader picture of the power and presence of Jesus as fully God and fully man. All authority, all power. I look no further, do you? And understand the power and presence of God through Jesus Christ. I love that because it talks of relationship. And when God the Father comes, as he did through the person of Jesus in the flesh, then does that display an amazing love. That no matter what you're going through, no matter what you're facing now and maybe into the week, our Heavenly Father reaches down, he comes down, and he abides with you as you abide with him. He spends time with you. I remember as a kid, and my brother and people probably remember the same thing, we took a family vacation, um, not so much right now with all this craziness going on, 
um, we're obviously a little older now, but I remember as kids, we took this really cool vacation, Colorado. We went out to, to, uh, to Denver, Colorado, and I want to say we were going to Wally World, but we were far from it. We weren't going to an amusement park. I wish we were, so we packed up the family truckster, a blue paneled 19, I think it was like a 78 or whatever it was, uh, station wagon. It looked just like the Griswolds, but it was blue. We packed up that thing to the teeth. Me, my mom, my dad, my two brothers, we threw a mattress in the back, we slept in the back, we thought we had a camper that was just luxurious, and off to Colorado we went from Connecticut. But not to amuse them, we were going to a church conference. Woohoo! Yes! Hallelujah! We were going to a church conference, and every time we would go somewhere growing up in a preacher's home, it was like my parents were always like, hey, we're going to take the weekend and we're going to go away. And we're like, okay, what conference are we going to? Well, it's going to be a great hometown. They got a pool. I'm like, okay, cool. <laughs> so that's what we would do. That was always the catch for us PKs. And we went to this really cool little hotel uh, out in Colorado. I did some great sightseeing, went through all the Badlands and the Dakotas and all the different monuments and had some really great time. It was a great family vacation. Um, and we had an awesome time, but it was, we were heading to a national conference uh, for our, for churches, and so um, as as we were there, we were hanging out in a hotel, and, and we were just relaxing and enjoying some time, and my brother and I were just goofing around the pool, Pete and I were goofing around, my brother Steve, he's using a sun gun, he kind of lays out, and just leave him alone, he's fine, right? So my brother and I were goofing around around the pool, and we we're little daredevils, and so we decided, hey, you know what, let's just kind of trump the ante, the cannonball got so old, so let's start doing some can openers, and let's start diving a little further out, and let's, hey, why don't we try flipping that? That's really cool. Around the concrete in ground pool. That's awesome. Let's figure that out. That's really fun. So we did. So we started kind of goofing around the pool and we're running around. And my dad and mom were kind of relaxing, laying out. But my dad always had an eye on us the whole time. My father was always checking us out because he knew we were a little crazy. So he kind of had one eye open, one eye closed. And, and so we're goofing around. And so me and my brother, he, no, I think Pete started the whole thing. He wanted to start flipping off the corner. And now he's daring me. That's usually what happens even to this day. Like, hey, I'll do it if you do it. So here we are as kids, and we're jumping off the side of this pool, in ground pool, concrete, you know, no safety, really. The signs weren't even there at that time, like whatever. So we're just jumping in and out of the pool. And so we started trying to trump each other. How far out? How, how many trip flips can you do? And so, well, he's going crazy, so I have to follow up. I can't whip out. So I jump off, and I do this crazy flip, and I try, well, I didn't jump far enough out, and so I hit my head on the corner of the pool, concrete, yeah, and so when I hit my head on the concrete pool, it kind of knocked me out. Like, I'm like an eight-year-old kid, eight, nine years old. Knocked me out, I hit the water, and, and thank God my brother Pete was there, and he was kind of like, you know, uh, you know, they pass a hot bay watch, what do I do? You know, and he's ready to come in after me. But my father was was laid down one eye open, one eye closed, and between my, my brother and my dad, by the time I got maybe halfway down to the bottom of the pool, knocked out, just a weird feeling, like I'm trying to move and I can't move. You get unconscious, it hit me so hard, open dash in my head, still have the scar to prove it. I'm sinking and I and I and I can't gather myself together. Well, my father. My brother jumps in, he's looking around, my dad just dove in, grabbed me, pulled me all the way up, got me out of the pool, I got blood all over the place, and I'm a little freaked out, we're all a little freaked out, but I was alive, I was okay. Why? Because my father came to my rescue with the help of my brother. But my father came to my rescue, and as I, as I began to kind of just kind of recover, we went to the hospital, got a few stitches, hair, all this kind of stuff, tied together with just big gash. Um, I began to realize I was so thankful. I mean, I, that could have been it for me. I was so thankful that I had my dad watching out for me and my brother. You see, it's so awesome when we know that we have our Heavenly Father watching out for you. That when you fall, when you trip, when you bang your head, when you get bruised, when you get beaten, when you get ridiculed, God is there. And he's ready to pull you up and pick you up and restore you and help you. That's our God. And he came in the form of Jesus, in the flesh, to be right by your side, to be right by my side. Because he loves you. He loves you. 
And no matter where you find yourself today, maybe you're, you're feeling that you're in that pool and you're trying to find the surface and you feel that you're drowning in all of the anxiety and stress and fear. God is right there and he wants to pull you up and restore you because he loves you and he cares for you. He cares for you. Hebrews 4.15 says it this way. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we have, yet without sin. He understands. Remember when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness and the Spirit of God led him there? It's another conversation when we talk about the Trinity. In other words, woo, we'll get to that in a couple of weeks. But in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 4, those first few verses in the Gospel, we see this unfolding of Jesus being tempted. He's led out into the wilderness. He's fasting 40 days. Good idea, by the way. He's fasting 40 days, and all of a sudden, Satan comes to him, and he's like, hey, let me throw a few things by you. Why don't you turn these stones into bread? Think you can do it? What was Jesus' response? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word ah, comes out of his mouth. Satan said, well, oh, oh, okay, well, hey, why don't we go up on the top of the, the temple here and why don't you just launch yourself off it? Those angels will save you, won't they? Jesus, again, what did he do? He picked up scripture. He said, don't test God. How dare you test God? Satan got a little frustrated. Hey, let me remind you, look around you. Look at all the worldly things around you. Look at all the kingdoms. Hey, I can give all this to you. Jesus is like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? I'm going to worship God and him alone. And he refuted the enemy with the word of God. Church, when the enemy comes in like a flood, you grab the word of God. And you begin to realize the person of Jesus fully God, with all authority, all power, to refute anything the enemy brings your way. And this is where it is. And God will give you his power and his strength to restore you, to fight against anything that the enemy tries to do, to make you think or sway you to believe Jesus is anything other than what the Bible says, fully God, and fully man. You see, recognizing Jesus from the beginning, it, it gives us hope. It gives you hope to see him eternally. It gives you hope. It gives me hope. When we recognize Jesus from the very beginning, because he was there from the very beginning, and he'll be there in the very end. And he's with you all the way through. Welcoming Jesus in right relationship, see, it removes the wrongs as his power restores you. It removes those wrongs. When you're in a right relationship with Jesus, it removes the wrongs, and then there's this restoration process. That's why Jesus came. That's why Jesus came. So oftentimes, we can be swayed by false teaching. So oftentimes, we can be distracted. And when that happens, we run to the Word of God. Run to the Word of God. Spend time in His Word. Spend time in prayer. Spend time in community as His church. When one's down, we're all down, by the way. When I hear that someone's hurting, or there's a, a family struggling, or there's a marriage on the break, or there's students that are trying to figure out what's next in their relationship, when there's an individual just kind of feeling isolated and alone, especially now, man, we're all down. We're going to rally together, and we do to pray and call on God, to open up the Word of God and say, oh, who's Jesus to you? What's your definition of Jesus? Church, what's your definition of Jesus? Is he truly fully God and fully man in your life where you know, without a doubt, according to God's Word, he has all power, all authority to restore you, to make you well, to help you no matter what you're going through. Don't leave here today. Don't stop that recording until you understand who Jesus really is according to the Bible, fully God, fully man, ready to restore, ready to heal, ready to help. 
I close with a takeaway in the Word of God. In Colossians chapter 2, 9 and 10, I love this New Living Translation. It really sums up the entire text that I believe that God has put out in front of us to absorb and to live out. And it says, For in Christ lives all the fullness of God in human body. So you also are complete. Pause. You're complete. You're complete. Christ lives in the fullness of God in the human body. There's a power and presence of God through Jesus Christ, and it makes you complete through your union with Christ, who is the head over every ruler and authority. Head over every ruler and authority. Head over every problem. Head over every circumstance. Head over every anxiety, every fear, every setback. Every disappointment, he's head over it. Church, who's Jesus to you? And may I encourage you to recognize him as fully God. In all his divinity, in all of his power, in all of his splendor, and recognize him as fully human because he came down in the person of Jesus to love you, to have relationship with you. To know full well who Jesus is. A thought I'd like to leave with you is that welcoming Jesus in authentic relationship, it activates God's power at work in us. It activates God's power at work in us. See, when we recognize Jesus from the beginning, it allows us to ultimately see him in the end. And when we welcome him in relationship as he has come down, in humanness, we welcome Jesus in authentic relationship. And man, I don't know about you, but it activates the power and presence of God to work in and through our lives to restore us for even greater things. May you be encouraged this morning to be reminded of the power and presence of God through Jesus and Him alone who brings life and life everlasting. Let's pray together. I don't know where you are, church, in relationship with God through the person of Jesus Christ, but may I encourage you this morning, before you leave here today, or before you turn off this broadcast online, may you encounter the power and presence of Jesus in your life. The person of Jesus, fully God, fully man, may you encounter the supernatural power and presence of Jesus in your life. Wherever you find yourself on the journey of faith in Christ, God is waiting for you to respond because he loves you. And he sent Jesus as the perfect sacrifice, the plan of salvation from the beginning to the very end for you and for me that we would have life and life everlasting. He provided the way. Now it's up to us. It's up to you to decide, do I believe this? Can I confess this? When you do, you begin a new journey. Understand the person of Jesus and the power of his presence that God has given him to restore you, to make all things new, to bring you back into right relationship, authentic relationship, true relationship in Jesus. Whatever you've heard this morning as we've unpacked the word of God, maybe you have questions. If you have questions, we'd love to spend some time with you either today or even through email and conversation. We'd love to have you dial in with us. Um, I want to pray before we leave, and I want to invite you as I'm praying. Pray with me. Maybe you, you know Jesus, but maybe you really have not encountered his presence and you need that today. I'm going to pray with you. Maybe you don't have that relationship in Jesus at all, the person of Jesus. You want to commit your life to him today, whether in this room or online, I'd like to pray with you as well. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for your love for us. We thank you, God, that you loved us so much that you sent your only Son, Jesus, to die on the cross to bring us life, restoration, right relationship back with you. And I pray in Jesus' name that 
that you would mend hearts and mend relationships, restore homes, restore marriages, restore our lives back to you. We recognize Jesus in all of his splendor and glory and majesty. As divine and as human, we thank you for the power and presence of Jesus. And I pray for those that are listening in or in this room that Maybe the relationship with, with Jesus is, is kind of uh, on the fence, and I pray, God, that you would strengthen them. I pray for those that, Lord, that don't know you, that, Lord, through this message today, that they would, they would take steps to move toward you. To receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. That, Lord, all that we do, all that we say, is in the image of God, through the person of Jesus. As our lives are changed, as your church is transformed into even greater days and ways through the power and presence of God through Jesus, that we can reach more and more. We can share the good news with those around us. And that all that we do, all that we say, gives you honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I want to encourage you, don't just get up and dash out of here. It's a beautiful day. You enjoy it enjoy it, but I'm enjoying this presence right now. I want to encourage you. If you need prayer, you want to spend some time right here in this sacred space, stay. If you need to slip out, our host team will help escort you out row by row from the back to the front. I just ask that you put the masks on once you start moving around. Thank you so much for being with us this morning at the Milford Assembly, your hometown church. Thank you so much for being online with us this morning. We hope to see you soon here at Milford Assembly and love to dial in and connect with you and continue to point you to Jesus with the message of the gospel where real life happens. God bless you.
your life. Begin to let the person of Jesus, the power of Jesus, comes through the Word of God. And as you do, others will see Jesus in you. Your life will be restored, and those that you encounter will experience the Jesus in you. That's the goal, to point people to Jesus with the message of the gospel. Man, where real life happens. Experience your real life this week in Jesus. God bless you. Have a blessed week. We'll see you back next week as we continue our series uh, on location and online. Go to the grace of God.